Bearing the Cross and Church Relationships, the name of the lesson tonight. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. You know, when I first began to follow Jesus Christ as a young man, I understood these words to mean that in becoming a Christian, I needed to be prepared to you know, bear the attacks of the world because of my choice to be a disciple of Jesus. As time went on, however, I discovered that the majority of the bruises and the majority of the cuts and the blows that I suffered were inflicted upon me not by disbelievers and sinners, but by the very people with whom I shared a place in the body of Christ. And I think that experience is similar to many people that I've talked to in the church. They say things like, wow, never mind what people outside the church do to you to make you feel bad. It's nothing compared to what people inside the church do to make you feel bad. You know, it seems at times that the heaviest cross that we're called on to bear is the one that we carry among ourselves in our church relationships. And so for this reason, I'd like to examine the Apostle Paul's experience in this type of cross-bearing. It's not the only type of cross-bearing, but it definitely is one type that many people in the church have to bear at one time or another. Perhaps Paul's example can serve us today when we have to bear the cross of dealing with unkindness and offenses that our brothers and sisters uh, commit against us. Now we read a lot about the suffering that Paul endured at the hands of the Jewish leaders and of course at the hands of pagans but there are as many instances of offenses and attacks to Paul, on Paul, by people who call themselves Christians as well. For example, they attacked his conversion. We read about that in Acts chapter nine, uh, verses 10 and following. You know, Paul's rejection and abuse began even before he was converted. Ananias, even after receiving a vision and command to go preach to Paul, was hesitant for fear of Paul's past reputation. We read in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, that after his baptism, Paul immediately begins to preach Christ to his city. But when he goes to Jerusalem to be with the brethren, they question the sincerity of his conversion and they won't associate with him. Imagine, he's a new Christian and the church doesn't want to have anything to do with him because of his past. So people in the church attacked his very conversion, thinking it wasn't really sincere, it must be some kind of a trick. They also attacked his work. Acts chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, let's read that. Acts chapter 14, verses 27, 28. It says, when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they spent a long time with the disciples. And then in 15, verse one, it says, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be uh, you cannot be saved. So I want you to note that after his first missionary journey, where he succeeded in making many converts and planting many churches at the risk of his own life. Imagine, you have a worker here out there you know, preaching, establishing churches. He was stoned, left for dead in Lystra, for example, Acts chapter 14. I mean, he really suffered to go out and preach the gospel. And after all of this effort, an attempt is made by some in the church to discredit his work among the Gentiles. As we read in Acts chapter 14 and 15, legalistic brethren insisted that his work was in vain 
and his converts needed to be circumcised to actually become Christians. He received no encouragement, no confirmation, no validation, only an effort to destroy his work. They also attacked his, uh, well, no, no, too fast. They also attacked his position as an apostle. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, shall we? Chapter three. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 1. <clears throat> You get there, sorry. I thought I added Mark. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse one says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? And then again in Second Corinthians chapter 10, this time verse 10, it says, Paul is saying here, for they say his letters are weighty and strong but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible? People in, those were words not from people outside the church against Paul, they were words by people inside the church against him. They attacked his position as an apostle. The brethren dismissed his credibility as an apostle and he was made to compete with false teachers for a position of authority within this congregation. Now here's the hard part a congregation which he himself planted. Can you imagine the insult? You plant a church, you baptize the first people, you get it started, you suffer and you sacrifice to make this congregation a, a, a Christian church. And after a time, this church which you taught, which you planted, begins questioning your authority, your position, your credibility. They're saying, well, his letters are you know, pretty weighty, but he's not much in person. He's not much of a speaker. He's not very dynamic. They also attacked his position, his teachings. Acts 21, 17 to 26, when he returned to Jerusalem after a decade of missionary effort all through the Roman Empire, some brothers began to circulate rumors among Jewish Christians that Paul was somehow denigrating or dismissing the law of Moses. And in order to keep the peace, he was asked to humble himself and acquiesce to their prejudice by taking a vow and make a public showing of his respect for the law in order to placate them. This was something he was not bound to do, he didn't have to do this, but he did it anyways to, to, to keep the peace within the church among the brethren. And what did he get for his trouble? He was arrested and he was put into prison. And you know, you didn't see anybody come to his rescue, did you? We don't read in the Bible that the church wanted to come to his rescue. He was out on a limb and it just, they left him there. They also attacked his character. In Galatians 1, 6 and 20, I don't have time to read all these passages. You know, he says to the Galatian brethren, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Galatians 4, verse 16, I've had that experience. All preachers have had that experience. You get up and you tell the truth about something in the congregation, something like, you know, brethren, we're not working as hard as we should, or brethren, what happened? We're not giving as we should, or, or there's sin in our congregation, or there's a problem with gossip, and we need to stop doing it. That's the job, that's why you have the preacher. You have the preacher so he'll speak the word of God to you. And it isn't always pleasant. And how many times has it happened that the person who you know, we take out our frustration on is the preacher because he told us something we didn't like. Go out the side door instead of the back door. <laughs> Paul was made to establish the fact that he was indeed sincere to the brethren who were casting aside the gospel of freedom and returning to the yoke of the law. They had eagerly received and believed him as sincere at first, but now, through the influence of false teachers, they were doubting his integrity. Imagine, they doubted his integrity. He who was suffering in jail in order to bring them the gospel. 
<laughs> and they were accusing him of being insincere. I mean, think about that for a second. Incredible. This wasn't an accusation brought against him by pagans or even Jews. It was an accusation brought against him from the people that he himself had baptized. They attacked his motives. In Philippians chapter one, go to Philippians chapter one, verse 12. Interesting read here. Paul says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, and the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. And so the final insult to Paul anyways comes while he's in prison. And he's in prison not for having you know, a, dr a driving drunk or anything, he's in prison for preaching the gospel and many remain free preaching in his place. Some, he says, are doing it to bring souls to Christ, but others, he mentions, preach with the purpose of self-glorification or profit and assume that Paul had done so with the very same motive. As these people succeeded in their preaching, they thought this would make Paul jealous and have him chafing at the bit to be released so that he could be free to compete with them. Imagine, the man who's in prison for preaching the gospel is being accused of being greedy, is being accused of doing it for the money. They gloated over the fact that they thought their preaching provoked Paul into some kind of jealous rage and envy because they thought his motives were impure just like their motives were impure. Paul says that at the hands of unbelievers he suffered beatings and lashings and imprisonment, stonings and many death threats. But a simple review of his life also shows that at the hands of the brethren he suffered rejection, doubt, attempts to discredit him, his ministry, his teaching, his, motiv his motivation, his honesty, and his characters. His character, rather. The disbelievers beat his body to a pulp, but it was left to the believers the task of trying to destroy his spirit. You know, the, you know, I go to OC for the preacher's luncheon, as does Marty and Dayton and other preachers go there. And they're constantly looking for preachers. The big complaint is always, well, we can't find preachers. We need preachers. We need preachers to fill pulpits. You look in the, you know, uh, what is it, the Chronicle, all kinds of positions for preachers. And you wonder, why, why don't men go into that role? They're afraid. <laughs> it isn't the money they're afraid of. It's the brethren, many times, that they're afraid of. Now the amazing thing is that the one to whom this was done was by any standard that you wish to use, tremendously successful as an individual Christian and as a minister. His Christian life was above reproach. He was well educated socially, intellectually, and theologically. He had a personal calling of the highest and clearest nature. He possessed spiritual gifts in abundance. Through his preaching and teaching, many churches were established, workers were trained, people were saved. You would think that he would be the very last person who would have to bear a cross, and a heavy cross at that, among those who call themselves Christians. I dare say that if any one of us would have had to suffer the mean-spirited doubting and meddling and rumor-mongering and rejection that he endured, man, we would have packed it up a long time ago. I don't know if I could have taken it, I don't think so. And yet, and yet, 
There we go. He bore this among his nasty brethren from the beginning of his Christian life until the end. And so I think he has something to teach us in this regard. Something to help us learn how to bear our own cross in church relationships. How to love brethren who are difficult to love. Because you know what? Not just the preacher suffers and has to bear a cross, but members also are sometimes put through the ringer by other members and they have to bear a cross not from pagans, not from the devil, but from their own brethren because of their lack of love. And so how do we do this in the church? I'm using Paul simply as an example to show you that even the best of us, Paul I think was the best of us, even the best of us are sometimes attacked, sometimes hurt by others. So you can imagine the rest of us who you know, don't live up to that standard, we're, we're a, a much easier target. So Paul bore a heavy cross among his brethren and he did it, as I observe his life, in the following way. First of all, he was not overcome by the evil of other people. Uh, we have that passage in Romans chapter 12. I'll read that in a moment if you want to go there. In this passage in Romans 12, Paul gives all of us a pattern that we need to use in order to mold our response to unfair criticism or rejection or malicious gossip or other offenses made against us from time to time by other Christians. Let's face it, all we have in the church are sinners. We don't have any other kind of people. Everybody's a sinner. That means everybody has weaknesses, maybe in different places, but we're all sinners. Well, you put together 300 sinners together in one place, what's going to happen? Trouble, <laughs> offenses, heartache, insults. Look at the process that he lays out in these verses with the view of not being overcome by the evil of others. In verse 17, he says the following. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. So in other words, he says, avoid the natural impulse to seek revenge. It is natural to want to get back, get even, get revenge. It's natural. Don't feel bad if you have that feeling when you are offended. But Paul says, avoid that impulse. Know that it's coming and try to deal with it. Verse 18, he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Search for peace, not victory, not vindication. This is what we should be praying and begging for in our prayer, not just a way to get even or to get, a lot of times you know, say, oh God, please let them see that I'm right. Oh God, please, please let them, let, let them finally open their eyes so they'll see that I'm innocent, that I'm the victim here, that I did nothing wrong. But Paul says, you should rather be striving to have peace. Peace is more profitable in personal relationships than justice. In verse 19 he says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. Trust in God's justice when it comes. And when God's justice comes, it will be fair. It will be true, it will be reasonable. It requires faith to trust in God's justice. Why? Because His justice doesn't come right away. Somebody says something hurts you, wounds you, stabs you. You'd like the justice to happen right away, wouldn't you? A thunderbolt come out of the sky, wham! And as you're looking at the dust and ashes of your brethren, you say, you see, I, I told you I didn't do that. <laughs> you know, kind of a win-win situation, but it doesn't happen like that, does it? It doesn't happen. You may have a brother or a sister in the church that's like a thorn in the flesh to you. You have to wait for God's justice. You have to wait for Him because 
He sees not only their failing in hurting you, He also sees your failing as well. Verse 20, He says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Your response uh, towards your offender is doing what is right and good. This is what you should seek and this is what you should do. Why? Because in doing so you mitigate the evil that takes place in the church. Uh, in the Middle East, what's the problem? You think that'll ever get settled, all the arguments that they're having in the Middle East? And arguments is putting it mildly. No, why? because both sides believe and act based on the idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Both of them do that. So one side attacks, the other side, all right, we'll attack you double. Oh yeah, we'll attack you three times. Oh yeah, we'll attack you four times. Oh yeah, we'll attack you five times. You don't believe me? Just look at human history for the last thousand years. And we think we're going to go in and resolve all of this, but that's a political speech, not a sermon. Your response towards your offender is to seek peace with him, with her. Your response towards your offender is to do what is right and what is good. Why? Will that settle the argument? No, but it will mitigate the evil that will come if you try to take your own justice. Verse 21, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't permit yourself to be overwhelmed by someone else's evil. Let your own goodness be what dominates every relationship, especially relationships within the church. My relationship with you, I mean as individuals, is one that seeks for your good, not my good. Let your goodness be the thing that sets the agenda, that sets the pace, not the other person's offense or weakness. When evil wins over good in any single relationship within the church, we are all made weaker. Goodness must always triumph in the kingdom of God. And I always tell people, you know, this business about you getting even, or you not talking to this person forever, or you giving them a cold shoulder, or you gossiping about them, or whatever you're doing, I ask you, who is telling you to do that? Is that Jesus talking to you? Is that His voice inside of you saying, you know what, you ought never to talk to that person ever again. I'll tell you what, don't even sit near them, don't even come near them, don't look at them, don't breathe on them, right? Let's do that, let's go for it. Is that Jesus, really? Is that the Lord giving you those kind of prompts? Another way that Paul bore his cross successfully was that he was always I'm sorry, I've got this PowerPoint backed up here. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's, I hope that's helpful, that PowerPoint I'm showing you. <laughs> Loving the church successfully. He was always thanking and praising God. Let's go back to Philippians, shall we? Philippians chapter four this time. Beginning in verse four, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul, the victim of so many attacks by the brethren, offers the perfect remedy for the fatigue caused by cross-bearing in the church. It's very tiring to bear a cross in the church because in the church you're wanting to be free, you're wanting to be open, you're wanting to be joyful, you're wanting to be you know, loving everyone and everyone loving you. So if you have to bear a cross in that environment, that, that's very tiring. So in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, you know, Paul 
describes how men were cast headlong into darkness and even ever increasing disbelief and sin. Why, he says? Because they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. Now you're wondering, how, what are these two, you know, what are these two scriptures, how are they related? Well, they're related in this way. A constant stream of praise and prayer and thanksgiving not only strengthens personal faith in God, but it also discourages mistrust and offenses between brethren. I've never seen a fist fight break out during a song service. <laughs> Maybe anecdotal evidence for you scientists, but I've never seen a fist fight break out during a song service. Praise and prayer acts like a, a, a spiritual de-icer. You know what a de-icer is, if, if you're in a plane and you're especially in the north and it's cold, they say, well, we'll be leaving five minutes late. The guy gets up on the, the big, uh, what is the, you know, the elevated the box there and he's got a hose and he's spraying de-icer on the wings because he doesn't want the wings to form ice and weigh the plane down and, and make, it, make it crash. Well, prayer and praise act like a spiritual de-icer that prevents the hardening of attitudes and hatred towards one another and allows our lives to be lifted up beyond anger and beyond the thirst for revenge. I didn't say to you, don't be angry and don't be offended. I mean, it's impossible. But when offended or misused or underestimated or disregarded, I have found that turning the event over and over in my mind and looking at it from every angle only increases my resentment and tempts me into planning strategies for revenge. The more I think of the offense, you'd think that if I understood it and reasoned it, it would go away. No! It just keeps getting bigger. I, I keep thinking about it and I realize, you know what? I just realized that he, he insulted me a third way that I hadn't even realized before. So guess who's talking to me when he's saying, wait a minute, you didn't consider this other thing here. You know, he really put you down. Didn't you see what he said to you? I mean, look at this. Have you noticed this? You don't deserve that. Again, who's talking to me? Who's saying that to me? I feel much better, however, when I begin to uh, douse the smoldering embers of my anger with a review of the things concerning the character of God that caused me to praise Him, His power, His wisdom, His kindness, His beauty, and follow that with heartfelt thanks for the many blessings I enjoy. Seems crazy, doesn't it? Seems that, you know, how does one connect with the other? But it does. When offended, when hurt, instead of concentrating on that, I concentrate on praising God in order to take care of that, of that hurt. And when this is followed by sincere prayer for help to bear this particular cross and the one who causes me to carry it, carry it, yes, even prayer for the one who's offended me, it is amazing how light that burden becomes. I can't erase the history of it. It happened, whatever it was, it happened. You know, this business of forgive and forget, you can forgive, but you know what? You'll never forget. We never forget. I still remember offenses that people said or did to me 40 years ago, I still remember. Obviously, Paul knew this, for he clearly expresses the results of such spiritual exercises by describing the peace that he felt brought about by his own rejoicing and prayer a peace which began in his heart, but in time permeates the entire, the entire church. You see, the prayer and the praise comes before the peace, not after. I'll say it again. The prayer and the praise must come before the peace, not after. After comes joy. And then finally, in Paul's cross-bearing, he made sure that he wasn't distracted. Let's go to 2 Timothy 
Shall we? Second Timothy chapter, um, chapter four. Take a look at a passage in Second Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse five. Paul says, but you uh, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. And so in his instructions to a young man, a young Christian, a young evangelist, Paul prepares him for the worst. He says, despite the difficulties, he exhorts him to be prepared and endure hardship and not let the obstacles outside or inside the church keep him from doing what he must do as an evangelist. In other words, do not let the cross bearing that you have to do distract you. Keep your eye on the prize. I suppose this advice is apropos since it seems that preachers by the very nature of their work are called upon to bear with many attacks and usually carry a heavy cross within the church. And so Paul is confident of his reward as he sees the end in sight. And he encourages Timothy not to use the many offenses that occur within the church as reasons to quit or to get sidetracked but rather as obstacles to be overcome in giving God glory through the perseverance of the saints right to the end. That's what gives God the glory. God is never glorified by quitting. He's glorified by perseverance. Paul absorbed the shocks and the blows, but he kept doing his job without distraction or stopping until the end. Well, let me summarize by saying the life of a Christian is one of cross-bearing with those outside as well as those inside the church at times. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Paul experienced both. He survived both. And in the end, the offenses against him, especially in the church, served to deepen his relationship with Jesus Christ served to rejoice in the spreading of the gospel and heightened his anticipation of being with the Lord forever in heaven. Remember, he is the one that said the following words, for me to live is Christ and to die, to die is gain. Imagine being able to say that and mean it. Brothers and sisters, there will always be offenses within the church. Don't be surprised. Not just the preacher, everyone, elders, imagine the things they have to bear at times, and deacons. There will always be the need to bear the cross among the brethren. This is so because, as I said before, we're all sinners. Forgiven sinners, heaven-bound sinners, but still weak and sinful nevertheless. We should therefore be ready and not surprised when this happens to us. Don't use this as an excuse to sin. Don't use the offense that someone does against you. Uh, don't use that as an excuse to be angry or to cause trouble or to quit the church or go back to the world or to quit this congregation in search of one where there will be no offenses. You know, this, this year will be 34 years that I'm preaching the gospel as, you know, as a way to earn my living. And I can't tell you how many people thought that by leaving this congregation or any other congregation that I worked in, somehow they thought by leaving this congregation and going to another, they would find this perfect church where no one said anything wrong and all the elders were kind and wise and knew all the answers and the preachers would never say anything that you know, disturbed them. And you know what? They never found that church. That church only exists in the mind of someone who's dissatisfied. We should therefore be ready and not surprised when this happens to us. When our turn comes to bear a cross among the brethren, 
try to remember some of the things that we've talked about here tonight. For example, overcome the evil in others with the good within yourself. Invest your emotional energy into praise and prayer, not anger or resentment or turning over and over again the offense in your mind. And don't permit personal offenses within the church keep you from bringing the good news to those who desperately need it on the outside of the church, because in the end this is just a strategy from Satan to make us less effective. If we set our minds on carrying our own personal cross in this way, we will contribute to the unity and love within the body as antidotes to divisiveness and we will promote spiritual healing. We will be able to maintain our own sense of spiritual balance despite the weight of the load that we carry. And we'll be able to give God glory by persevering in our own souls despite the offenses we bear. And as a bonus, we will bring others to Christ with our example. Because when you're offended, when you're hurt, when you have something going on with some other brother or sister in the church, I guarantee you that somebody else is watching. I guarantee you that somebody else knows what's going on and they're watching how you respond. They want to see how you deal with unfairness or unkindness because as a Christian, you're the model for that other individual. In the end, I firmly believe that the crown that we receive will be worth the cross that we, that we bear. In closing, I want to remind you that sometimes we are the cross that someone else has to bear. We're the ones that cause the offense. We're the person that puts the burden on our brother or sister because of our unkindness, our insensitivity, our disrespect. In other words, sometimes we're not the victim, we're, we're the perpetrator. Sometimes somebody is going home and getting on their knees and praying and saying, dear God, please help me deal with that Mike character. He's making me nuts. Sometimes we're the problem. It'll help all of us, therefore, to be aware of the fact that there will be times where we wear the cross and there'll be other times when we are the cross. Of course, as good a model as Paul is for cross-bearing, Jesus remains the ultimate example of one who carried the cross. He not only endured insults, rejections, and offenses as a daily cross in order to preach the good news of the kingdom, he also offered his innocent life as a sacrifice so that all those who offended him would be forgiven. Imagine if God said to you, okay, now that person has insulted you and hurt your feelings, okay, now I want you to offer your life in order to save that person. Wow, oh, wow. I don't know if too many of us would be able to do that. This is the cross He bore for us. Our question is, are we willing to bear a cross for Him? Because uh, there are a lot of things I'm not sure of and a lot of things I don't know, but there's one thing I do know. He has never done anything to offend us. Never. And we will never have to bear a cross for Him because of his sinfulness. If your cross is heavy, and if you need forgiveness for the cross that you've been to someone else, or you need help in carrying the cross somehow that it's been given to you to carry, or you need courage to take up the cross for the first time, then at this time in the lesson and during the service, as is our custom, we offer an invitation to anyone who may need to Bear the cross of Christ in whatever way He has called you. If you need that, please stand and let's sing together. And if you need to come forward, please do that as we sing the song of invitation. <laughs>